It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm Austin Peterson, as always, typically joined by my co-host, Landon Mance, who happens to be taking some time off to do some skiing in Southern Utah this week. But I am excited to have Nancy Padberg, CEO of Catholic Education Arizona, on the podcast with us today. Nancy, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's an honor to be here with you, Austin. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. So for our listeners, I'll just uh, let them know that we've known each other for about a year and a half, maybe close to two years by now. Uh, we've been a Vistage group together and, and I have uh, the utmost respect for Nancy and what she does and how she carries herself and, and uh, what she does for our community. So I'm super excited for our conversation today. So Nancy, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself personally. I know a little bit of your story just because we've known each other and been part of this Vistage group and we get fairly vulnerable on the personal side as well. But um, for our listeners, tell us, you know, tell us your history about your family, your husband, your kids, those sorts of things, and, and we'll get going. Terrific. Thanks, Austin. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I think this really sets the foundation of, you know, why I'm here today is um, I grew up in Iowa. Um, but learn to be a goal setter at an early age. So I was setting goals at age 14, you know, to be uh, to play golf in high school, to play golf in college, to, um, you know, want to be a home candid homecoming candidate. I wanted to be an honor society. Like I wanted to do all these things, but uh, I was exposed early on to goal setting. So I think that really um, is the foundation of a lot of things I'll talk about today. Um, so originally from Iowa, played golf for Iowa State, um, advertising and, and marketing background. Um, but I wanted more. So I went on and got my MBA at Pepperdine University, which um, when you leave, you have this sense um, of purpose, service, and leadership. And that's what um, they send you out into the world to do. So I was fortunate to have that exposure and that, that guidance. Um, and then I've been in Phoenix for two years in this role of president and CEO of Catholic Education Arizona. Um, David and I have been married 30 years. We spent 21 years in Southern California, fortunately in um, Santa Monica and Woodland Hills, uh, two years in Seattle and three years in San Francisco. So we're thrilled to put, call Phoenix home and um, be here with my dad as he's aging and our daughter has joined us. Um, so um, Catholic Education Arizona is a phenomenal company, and I really can't wait to talk to you about it today. Yeah, I'm excited to, to have our listeners learn more about it. I've had some exposure, obviously, in our Vistage group, but I, there's still so many things that, that I don't know about it, and I'm excited to hear about. So I do have to mention the Ohio State, or not Ohio State, Iowa State cy Cyclones. Woo! So they, they had a great year this year in football. So that's nice to see. They don't, they're not always in that conversation. So I'm sure that's exciting for you to see. Oh my gosh. The fact that they were here playing in the Fiesta Bowl and won it, it it's the best team they've ever had. So um, we were really, really excited that they won and, and just were here. It's the shame we couldn't be there because I, I know we would have, but uh, we did watch them. Yeah. Uh, what a great team. Yeah, it's a crazy year. And, and you know, I look back and, you know, things will show up on Instagram or Facebook of, of things that I did, you know, two years ago with my son, we went to the Fiesta Bowl. And I thought, you know, of course, we would have been there this year if, if, it, if we'd been allowed to go. And it's, it's a tough thing to kind of realize that there are certain things that we can't do. But, you know, I think that it's given me an opportunity to step back and realize that it's not necessarily about the things that you do together. It's that you're together, right? So yeah. I, that's been, that's been a big thing for us. And, 
you know this, and, and I know Karen, our producer of the show, knows this, but my son was out of the country for two years. So I did, I did not touch or lay eyes physically on my son for two years. And having him come back on December 15th and spend the holidays together as, a, as an entire family was, was special this year. That had to be so hard. Um, and I bet he changed quite a bit when he was gone too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was 18 and a half years old when he left. And so he's, you know, 20 and a half now he'll be 21 in, in March and get back into school. But to see the amount of maturity that, that he gained in the last couple of years has been tremendous uh, to watch and to, to experience. Oh, awesome. Global perspective, huh? Yeah, that's, that's a big thing. And, you know, I think he learns the good and the bad about living in the United States. He learns the good and the bad about living in other countries and, you know, has a, has a greater understanding of, of certain social issues and immigration and refugees and, you know, all those sorts of things that he just wasn't exposed to as much uh, here. He's, you know, I, I tell my, my wife and kids all the time that, you know, that, there's, there's three silver spoons in, in our family and then there's me, right? <laughs> and so they, they have all lived pretty charmed lives compared to the way that I grew up, but it's given them some perspective and it's also given me some perspective as to what's possible and to help push them to, to greatness in, in this life. That's right. Yeah. Right. So I, I also wanted to mention real quick before we move on to Catholic Education Arizona. So you and I both, you know, have MBAs. You got yours at Pepperdine. I also lived in Southern California for a long time. My wife is from there. Her parents have lived in Irvine since 1969, oh which God. is before Irvine was even incorporated. So uh, they've lived there in that same house for a very long time. So we're very familiar with uh, with Southern California, and we have that in common. But um, also just the MBA thing, you know, I, I, I forget exactly how you worded it, but basically when, when you leave business school, you, you feel this sense of responsibility to go out and then lead. Right. And right. I felt that that same responsibility, but one of the things that I've said quite often on the show and, and just in life to other people that I've speak, spoken to is that the MBA program was great there. It's not that I didn't learn anything and that there weren't in, important principles and, and things that I learned along the way, but mm -hmm. the education itself wasn't actually the most valuable thing to me. It was the network of people that I came out of school with. Absolutely true. It's like yeah. your own vestige group in a way, right? Yeah. Reach out and, and, and talk to somebody about, Hey, how would you handle this? Or what do you think about this? Because you spent a couple of years in the trenches yeah. And you saw, um, you know, you're, when you're in school, you're tired, you're stretched, you're working uh, as well. I mean, at least, at least I did. I think you yep. did as well. Yep. <clears throat> so you see yourself at the best and worst and you really get to know your, your classmates really well. Yeah. Yeah. And I happened to finish my MBA program in 2008, right? When the economy was just oh. completely imploding. Um, and I had a business at the time that I, I've always had my financial planning business, but I owned a business on the side, which I've pretty typically done throughout my career. Uh, it's one that I think actually helps me to be more sharp as a business owner to have that side business with employees that run it and managing people. And, you know, my, my business is fairly small. It's myself and a couple of assistants and then Landon and I are merging to be partners, but it, there's not the HR issues and all those kinds of things that my business owner clients are going through. And so having this side business allows me to go along, go through that alongside them and, and help them or better understand what it is that they're going through. Yes. Understood. Yeah. Well, let's jump into Catholic education, Arizona. I think, you know, your background from what I, from what I know of it, you know, you kind of came from this advertising, marketing, social media type of a world. And you made this from my perspective, a pretty big leap to go from that to now you're running a nonprofit here in Arizona. So tell us how that came about and then tell us about Catholic education, Arizona. Sure, sure. So um, I spent my time in Los Angeles and Santa Monica was Los Angeles Times. And at the time, think about in the 90s, it was the Google and Facebook of advertising. They were doing a billion dollars in revenue and, and the results were terrific. But each year people started leaving the newspaper. And so 
Um, I went to cable for a couple years and learned a lot about events and promotions. And then I went to an ad agency as vice president for eight years, learned quite a bit about oh, branding, research, strategy. What do you need for an effective campaign? So I was very fortunate to work with clients like Petco, Whole Foods Markets, uh, Fairmont Hotels, Pepperdine University, and really how you have to understand the point of differentiation to go to market with your organization. So what sets you apart and makes you different? And you know, how do you use consistent messaging in different channels to reach your target audience? So that ad agency time was very informative for me, great years of learning and also the place where I worked, we worked on healthy culture. So at the same time I'm learning branding strategy and research, I'm also learning how to build a healthy culture. Now business school, that was my favorite class was organizational behavior. And that's all gonna feed into where I'm going with the story is that when you have a healthy culture, you have profitability. So when I started learning this and practicing it at the Phelps Group ad agency I was at, it happened, it was true. We really could have this value-based organization and serve clients that serve the world and make it a better place. So really sounds idealistic, but we did it. And it was really, really exciting. And, um, you have to be very selective too. You learn to hire the right people, right? Have the sure. right gifts, have the right attitude, have the right talent. So all that came into play with growing myself as a leader. Um, after I got my MBA, and as you alluded to, you are set to go lead. So you're either going to lead within an organization or you're gonna start your own, own organization. So I started my own organization and I had a digital marketing firm for several years, um, programmatic advertising, but my niche or point of differentiation was um, targeting baby boomers. And still to this day, they're the wealthiest demographic. So they're sure. about 55 to 75 years old right now. Um, gosh, I just, I think some, some great facts and, and you're going to know these, you know, they have the most luxury cars, the most luxury travel, the most second homes. Um, they like to go out to eat. They are the connectors on social media. I mean, there's so many things about, um, baby boomers that I got really excited about and really focused on that for several years. Then at the time, the technology was moving so fast in digital marketing that I didn't have the capital at the time to um, build a programmatic platform. So I thought, I need to go to a company that has all the digital tools. So we went to San Francisco for three years and I worked for Hearst Media mm -hmm. and I learned um, every digital tool, SEO, SEM, name the acronym, <laughs> and um, really built up the education division. Well, I was very fortunate um, to um, get contacted by a headhunter for the, the role here in Phoenix. And um, be, coming from the secular world, going to you know, a nonprofit, I thought, well, that's interesting, but I'm always up for a great challenge. I'm always how do I stretch and grow? And I'm Catholic. I mean, it all really worked well. And uh, two years ago, um, I accepted the, the job for uh, president and CEO of Catholic Education Arizona. And we wanted to come to Phoenix. That was the end game for us because my father's here and we want to be available to him. Now, what is so special about this organization? Why leave California after all these years? Well, I get to jump out of bed every morning knowing that I'm helping children, I'm helping build families and communities, which I don't think it's all so audacious to say that our team is helping change the world. And so let me, let me tell you a little bit how we do that. 
the organization is 23 years old. So great history, you know, really um, known in the community. But let's be honest, who wants to talk about tax credits? <laughs> Right. I mean, truly, it's a, it's not an easy topic. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not selling Porsches and Ferraris. Right. I'm educating people on how they can use tax credits to help underserved children. And so the story is great, but I just need the time to get to the value proposition. Right. So um, in 23 years we have provided 138,000 scholarships or $268 million we have raised. So really significant. We're holding the number one position of about 60 STOs right now. And what is an STO? That's how we're defined. We are a school tuition organization. So uh, about 19 states have these tax credit organizations. So it's really important we get to the new people that are moving into Arizona because they really can't believe it, that you can use your taxes that you owe Arizona and say, I want to provide it to this school. There's 37 schools you can choose from. And it, it's just like you paid the state of Arizona for your taxes. So it's a really great thing. Um, I think... <clears throat> When we get the testimonials and we get the stories of the children that have been able to go to the Catholic schools and um, really learn leadership skills and learn to be selfless, learn, um, well, here's a, thousands of hours of community hours are spent you know, by the children helping others. So not only do our schools have a 99.4% graduation rate, I mean, let that sink in, 99.4%. Yeah. And 97% of the graduates go on to college or military. I mean, if that's not a success story right there, um, we should have companies lining up you know, to provide their taxes. And we do. I mean, we do have 130 or so corporate partners. And um, we have... If you want me to segue now, I'll talk about our revenue streams. Sure. Does that sound yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, before before we get into that, though, <clears throat> I, I you hit some important points in yeah. that, you know, I'm not Catholic. I, I'm a I'm a Christian believer, right? But I'm not Catholic. But the reality mm -hmm. is the the success of the program is something that gets me excited as a taxpayer to say, well, gosh, can I can I put my tax dollars to work? in an organization like this, because I know what it does to benefit underserved communities and what it does to benefit our community as a whole, right? Because if we get people who are graduating from high school that maybe wouldn't have graduated otherwise yeah. and have an opportunity for a really quality education that they couldn't afford on their own, because let's be honest, a lot of these Catholic schools are pretty expensive private organizations that many people can't afford to go to. And so that's really where the rubber hits the road is that this, your organization allows many people who would never even have any chance of going to these schools to go to these schools and get a quality education and put them on a trajectory going forward that's phenomenal. That's right. And, you know, when you, when you say it that way, I think about the diverse communities in our schools and also about 30% are non-Catholics, Austin. I mean, great point. So we have the diversity um, that we're all striving for in today's world that should be there, that acceptance and understanding that's playing out in our 37 Catholic schools on a daily basis. So that trust and respect that you build for one another. Um, I think and just lastly in the education part, it's educating the whole child. It's just not in a specific it's just academic school, or it's just a sports related school or music. It's really holistic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a, a great organization that, that accomplishes a lot of great things. So 
why don't we just talk real quick about the actual logistics? I mean, I mean, if, if you're somebody who's brand new moving into the state of Arizona, mm -hmm. and that was me six years ago, it was you two years ago, yeah. that, that have never seen something like this before and don't fully understand how it works and what they need to do to be able to do it, why don't you just kind of walk us through real quick how it, how it actually works and that this is really a unique thing that the state of Arizona allows us to do because we're, we're really choosing where we want our tax dollars to go is That's my understanding. Right. That's right. You're absolutely right. So there's two main revenue streams to Catholic education Arizona. One is individual tax contributors. So if you're single or you're married, it's approximately single, it'll be around 1,100, married around 2,200 that you can contribute. And that's the cap for each. So yeah. um, for corporations, there's no cap. So let's say, let me give you some examples. Um, Grand Canyon University, Earnhardt Auto Centers, BBVA, SunWest Bank, all companies you know really well here in Arizona and have been contributing as corporate partners for us for a very long time. Um, it doesn't matter the size of your company. It doesn't matter the industry that you're in. We have dentists and CEOs and lawyers and CPAs and right. So from small to large and um, the underlying value though, for both individual contributors and corporations is that they want to help build people. They want to help families and communities. So that's what it comes back to is as soon as uh, people understand the story and the benefit, then they'll learn the how to do it. So um, if they visit our website, you know, ceaz.org, all of it's there. You can click on individuals, you can click, click on corporations. You know, if any, anybody wants to learn more about it, um, the th there, there's a, another revenue stream that's growing for us right now. And it's really, really exciting. Um, if you work for Intel or Wells Fargo or American Express, they will match, those employers match your contribution. So that's yeah. a growing area for us. So here's where I'm gonna tie the digital marketing together with this, okay? So yeah. um, we can geofence those organizations. So maybe only a few employees are in right now, but as employees start going back, we can geofence their organization. So I go to work in American Express and I can put an ad that hits their phone for 30 days about our organization. So these are the kinds of things we're now putting in place to let the new people know what's going on and how they can contribute. So, um, from programmatic advertising to, gosh, search engine optimization to Google ads, all this is new to our organization. And frankly, when I got here, now granted, I came from San Francisco, this is the heartbeat of digital marketing. I didn't see all of these different channels or all this different expertise here. And I'm really thrilled. I, I interviewed three or four different ad agencies and you can imagine I had a critical eye. Yes. Um, uh, so we, we chose Fast Turtle and Eric and his team over there have been fantastic. We have a beautiful new website and as you can imagine, so we're a $20 million organization and we have high days, very high days of traffic on our website. Well, that website has to perform. And yeah. so in December and April, we're just seeing these peaks during, you know, tax deadlines and um, our website is performing great. And I'm thrilled that we have a low bounce rate and um, average three to four pages at a time. And, you know, I won't rattle off our dashboard, but <laughs> we're kind of a digital marketing nerd. I love it. Yeah, no, I think that that's super important for what you're doing. And I, and I think really that's the bridge that connected you to an organization like this, right? Because the reality is, as CEO, you're responsible for the culture, people report to you that, you know, that's, that's a big deal, of course. But if, if I'm the one who's making the hiring decision for somebody that's coming in to be the CEO of an organization like yours, I want somebody that I know I can put in front of potential donors and that they're going to, and, and that will help us 
find additional donors. And that I think is pretty powerful and a, and a great reason to have, have hired you to run the organization. Well, thank you. I can add you to our board of directors then, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd be happy to, to have a discussion like that. And I, I will ask you to uh, introduce me to Eric at Fast Turtle. It sounds like he's somebody that we should have on the program. And, and obviously just, uh, so does he do the social media stuff and the website or just the website and social media is somebody else? Uh, great question. So uh, we have about five different services with them. So your SEO, your search engine optimization. So any of the organic content, um, we they help us create it. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be put on your website to increase your Google searches on page one. Okay. Um, SEM is a fancy name for search engine marketing, and that's your Google ads. So you're going to yeah. pay for Google ads. For the search words that people are searching for, you want your ad to come up first. Yep. So there's a constant um, bidding and trading platform um, and we're, we're bidding for the best bid for our ad to come up first. Um, it's really, um, with only S, you know, 60 STOs, I'm not saying there's a lot of competition in that, that space, but we're real fortunate um, to have that program. So SEO, SEM, um, they help us with a monthly newsletter. So they help us produce that. Uh, we go out to 22,000 people every month. And um, those are our corporate and of course, individual contributors. Also, um, all of our key stakeholders in our organization. So from parishes to schools to our bank partners. So anybody involved with our well-being and success. Um, so we also, they also help us with our social media, our Facebook paid, LinkedIn paid, and organic. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Sounds like a full service group and they're doing a good job for an organization like yours and obviously other businesses that are past guests on this program or listeners could benefit from what it is that they offer. So I, yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate a, an, an introduction there for sure. Great. we Will do. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that it's super clear that people understand, you know, at, as individual taxpayers, right? So I know that it's on a sliding scale in Arizona and it maxes out at about 4.65, but for easy math, you know, 5% is essentially your, your tax uh, liability. And so, you know, 2,200 bucks, as long as you're making more than $44,000, obviously we've, there's deductions and all those kinds of things, but you could technically choose to put all of the tax liability that you have to the state of Arizona and, and assign it, say, I want it to go to Catholic Education Arizona. Is that correct? That's correct. And frankly, what you do is you call our organization and we give you a receipt. So the money passes through us and we report to the Arizona Department of Revenue. Gotcha. So we have well, for 23 years, you know, the 990 form for a nonprofit and we have an audit every year by I, I Bailey. So we have been following, you know, of course, people are concerned about the money flow. It's really, really important to share all that's listed on our website and available, you know, how the flow works. Okay. And normal tax deadlines apply, right? I, do I have until April 15th of this year to contribute for last year? For individual contributors, yes. Okay. So I could technically write a check for $2,200 to Catholic Education Arizona. That receipt goes in with the filing of my taxes to show that I've already paid $2,200 of my state tax liability, but I've paid it to Catholic Education Arizona. That is correct. Hmm. But you make it easy. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I kind of have a mind for this financial thing, so it, it, it works for me. <laughs> and also just um, let you know, there's still corporate dollars available. So every year, the Arizona Department of Revenue sets aside, this particular area was $123 million. And just think of the different STOs. It's um, who can claim the most, the quickest, really. So we're fortunate. We're having a very good year. We're close to $10 million in corporate right now. Um, last year, we finished about six and a half million in corporate. So we oh. had a significant jump. Um, so 
there's still $8 million on the table to claim for corporate tax dollars. So if someone feels inclined to play that, that 2021 tax dollar now, um, they can do that. So on the, and the, on the corporate side, there is no limit, right? So, I mean, you mentioned a couple of big companies that are having, you know, high six figure liabilities for taxes. They can contribute all of it to Catholic education, Arizona, rather than paying it to the state. Absolutely. So explain to our listeners why the state is okay with doing something like that, why they support a, a process like that. Sure, sure. So there's 19 other states that have some kind of tax credit process or programs. Um, Some have vouchers. um, But in our particular case, um, 23 years ago, they started with the individual tax credit. And then I believe it was about 2009, 2010, they started the corporate tax credit. So you know, at the time when it was voted on, they could just see that it would help the underserved communities and children to be able to attend these schools. So it really is helping. I mean, I think if you look at 30,000 foot view, it's helping the underserved communities get a better education. And I, I don't want to say better, but to have one of your choice, to have one of your choice, you know. So um, there is a, the right school for each child. And, you know, some need bigger um, places to go to school. Some need small, smaller individual attention, you know, to go to school. So, you know, all that's very um, um, available at the Catholic schools. We have large and small, of course. But um, I think it's, it's just rooted in a value-based education. Yeah, I think I think really, I mean, the state has to look at it, or at least I would if I were running the state, and I think this is the way that they're probably looking at it, is they understand that by investing in these kids and helping them have that opportunity today, mm-hmm. that they're going to be less likely to have a need for state assistance later, right? Yeah. And so it, it's a numbers game. And then also, regardless, at some point, the state has to contribute dollars to cover some of these expenses. And so if we've got organizations that will help do it and do it well, mm. then why not just deploy the dollars that way? It, it ends up being the same in the end for the, for the state. And I'll bet you studies will show you that they've got less people on state assistance because of organizations like this. I would say you're right. And I think I need to put you in a commercial for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be clear. I've got a face for radio, Nancy. So I don't know about commercials. <laughs> well, said. Oh, well said. Yeah. All right. So I think we understand that. Obviously, if, if our listeners want to learn more about it, like you said, the website is CE, so Catholic Education AZ.org, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So obviously I'd encourage anybody to go ahead and take a look at it. It's a great program, great opportunity to, to contribute to underserved communities and their educational needs. Uh, K, K through 12, right? It's all, it's. It is K through 12. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. So let's take a quick break hear from our sponsor and then we'll come back and, and we'll talk about what I know you really love to talk about and that's a healthy culture. Excellent. Thanks Austin. Yeah. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, Tycoons, welcome back to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We're here with Nancy Padberg, President and CEO of Catholic Education Arizona. We've already talked about, obviously, her background and how she got to Catholic Education Arizona. We've talked about the impact that the organization has in our local community here, and uh, they're doing great, great things, obviously. But now I want to talk about what Nancy really lives and breathes to me. Like I said, I've known her for a year and a half, but I don't know that anybody lives and breathes this better than Nancy that I've met in my lifetime, and that's a healthy culture. So Nancy, talk to us about why a healthy culture in any organization is important. Thanks, Austin. I, I, 
I think in Vistage Group, I said, <clears throat> I know I speak to this at nausea, but you do have to repeat your message several times for people to understand it, especially this. So, and I think healthy cultures are defined different ways. Uh, but let me tell you the one that works for us. And I think it works for, for all people because it's built on trust, respect, value, and empowering others. And don't we all want that? At the end of the day, as human beings, we all want to be trusted, respected, valued, and empowered. So <clears throat> what we learned in, in business school, what I learned at the Phelps Group for eight years, and then just my own observations. As a leader, you're always observing. And when you appreciate people and just the simple thank you, it goes a long way. And so if you even look at surveys from organizations, would you rather be um, valued, appreciated, or would you like a raise? Nine out of 10 times people say, I wanna be appreciated. So I think, so that's just the foundation. Then what you have is compassion and competence and character, right? So compassion, do the people in the organization know that I care for you? Do you care for me or care about me? So you have to establish that. Two, can you help me? As a leader, can I help them? I, am I competent enough to help them grow? And third, um, character, can I trust you? So wherever you go into an organization, here's naturally what people think. Do you care for me? Can you help me? Can I trust you? So you have to establish those things before you really can lead. So consistent behavior is really important. Do you show up on time? Do you um, use consistent language? Do you um, stop and talk to somebody about, you know, their sick child? Um, do you care if somebody's 10 or 15 minutes late for work? I don't, you know, there's traffic, there's um, children, there's parents. So it's establishing a culture that I trust you. It's really up to you. If you want to violate that, that's up to you, your choice, but, but I trust you. So um, the other part of a healthy culture is always to be learning and growing. So if you're not learning and growing, I really believe you're going backwards because the world is constantly changing. I mean, I don't care if it's technology, which moves, you know, lightning speed or um, new skill sets. We are um, really out of the industrial age, right? We're in the knowledge era. So if you're not learning and growing and learning something about the gift that you lead, and I mean, if you're in finance or a controller or um, somebody in marketing, someone in operations, all this stuff's changing all the time. I want my team to always be learning and growing in their areas, but also learning and growing as people. So there's that care part and there's that help part when you establish, you know, I want you to learn and grow. Here are ways we can do it. So how do you build that? Because you can talk about it, you can talk about it, but what are the tactics? Right. That's really, I don't think that's what's talked about. How, how do you do it? So, yeah. well, I, I would even add for, for somebody who's not um, innately empathetic the way that I think that you are, um, or maybe you've just learned it over years, right. Is what are some tactics, like you said, that they can, utilize on a day-to-day -day basis to learn to be better at those things. I'll freely admit, I'm not great at those things. My, my wife and kids will tell you that I'm not great at those things. People who have worked for me in the past would tell me I'm not great at those things. I, I kind of grew up in a, in a family and a, and a culture of, you know, your, the pay that you get for the work that you do is your gratitude is your reward. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a, uh, it's a tough thing for me to learn. And I think it's a tough thing for a lot of people to learn. It is. Um, so this comes along with being a servant leader and having that mindset. I'm here 
to serve. So what, is, what does that mean? Um, removing barriers, removing obstacles that are in the way, um, I think it's having the self-discipline and commitment. And then that's the hard part. You have to commit to it that I'm here to serve. So um, it's, that's hard. That's hard. So I'm going to go back to your question. Was it natural to have empathy? No, I don't, I don't think I grew up also in a household that had it. But I started observing, how does that make me feel when other people don't listen to me? How does that make me feel? So I'm taking all the good and bad of the various places I've worked and where I've learned and what books I've read to make this place the best possible place you've ever worked and you never want to leave. And so we work on it. It's, it's true. So um, as a servant leader, I think you have to remove your ego. You, you're not here to serve you. You're here to serve your, your, your associates um, and your customers. I think you remove barriers and you have to have empathy. So those are the three key things for a servant leader. Remove ego, remove barriers, and have empathy. Um, you have to Which have is not easy for most leaders, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is not. And I say I have to practice it every day. You know, yeah. I mean, it'll creep up. It'll creep up. When when you live and work in Los Angeles for 21 years, you develop an ego. And that's all I'll say about that. You just do. <laughs> yeah. You just do. Um, I'm so happy to have my, my faith ground me and remember what is possible. And it's so clear to me, the good leaders bad managers that I've had that I'm like, I'll do that, but I'm not going to do that. I know how that made me feel. So people spend a lot of time at work. So yep. I think it should be a healthy place. I think it should be a place where we value one another. And so the tactics to do that on Mondays, we have lunch together. It's really important you break bread together. I, it's, it's amazing what you learn about someone's favorite trip or their dog's name or um, grandma's sick, whatever it might be. Now you're sharing and getting closer. It's, 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 it's terrific. Um, we did this at the Phelps group twice a week and we got very close. So I brought that to where I am. So every Monday we have lunch together. <clears throat> Every Monday morning, we have our Monday morning meeting, MMM. So what do you do in a, a Monday morning meeting? You do a check-in. Everybody goes around and they check in. How are you doing today? How was your weekend? And you know what? Inevitably, someone had a bad day or a bad weekend, and that's okay. That's all right. It, you're able to share it. And then we go into lightning round which then people talk about what are they focused on for the week and if they need help getting it done. So there's that collaboration piece. I'm vulnerable enough to say, could you help me Austin with this deadline? I have to have it done by here. And so we're creating this um, place to be vulnerable because let's face it, it's hard to do that. We learned that at Vistage, it's hard, yeah. it's hard to do that. Um, I was fortunate to learn that also at Pepperdine, we would do check-ins in business school. And boy, we devoted quite a bit of time in our classes to that. There is that deep relationship that starts being formed. Yep. So we're forming that. So again, there's another piece that I brought to this organization. Um, last year, talk about learning and growing. We read John Maxwell's book, 21 Indisputable Leadership Qualities. When you're in a pandemic and you're only on Zoom, how in the world do you build culture, my friends? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. 
So you have to have a focus together, a conversation and common language. And that book did it for us. We read it over a two month period and it really, every Zoom meeting we had, we went over a chapter and everybody could be involved that way. Yeah. So that was multi-layer. That was learning and growing or sharing. Someone could learn and lead the Zoom meeting about that chapter. So there were multiple ways to be able to get that culture built that way. But it took some time and some thought because as you know, every leader out there had to think on their toes and pivot quickly <laughs> to keep your company or organization going. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I, I obviously experienced it in my own business. Uh, I had a side business that I've, like I've mentioned earlier, you know, I've, I've always, always kind of had a side business and the side business didn't make it. I mean, it was, it was a mall kiosk business. There was no chance that business was going to make it. And, you know, nobody was in the malls and then they started to open them up and, you know, it, it was either hold on and just open it again or just shut it down and then say, am I going to do something else or will I reopen it later? And, you know, I've, I've actually done something else and we can talk about that offline at some point, but sure. it's, it's one of those things where um, I've had to watch it with my clients on my financial planning side. It was okay. People are going to be freaked out about this and I've got to pick up the phone and I've got to talk to my clients and help them to understand where we are and what's going on. And yeah, no, I've never, I've never lived through a global pandemic, but I've also, I've been doing this for 20 years. This is the third major market correction that I've been a part of. And I know how to handle this. And by the way, we set up your, your portfolios in anticipation of these types of deals, not in response to them. And so it's, you know, it's, it's letting them know that you're with them and being proactive. And so it was one of those where this is what my plan is. Mm -hmm. Right. And I all set, I'm very goal oriented like you are. And I'll say, you know, like for example, this year, and I'm going to write down the, the one that you just gave, and then I'll ask you for others. I'm going to send out an email to past guests and clients to get this, but my plan is to listen to or read 52 books this year. Right. Oh so one, one, one a week. Okay. <laughs> and so I need, I need a lot of options, right. From people yep. as to books that they've read before. So I know what to read, but um, that was something I was doing before the pandemic hit. And I had to let that go because I needed to be more proactive than I had ever been in my own personal business. We're talking about people's entire life savings that they're concerned about. Right. And they're turning on the news and they're seeing this and all they see are big drops in the stock market and, you know, everything else that's going on politically in a very, you know, disputed political season, all those sorts of things. And so I had to let that go and be willing to say, this is where my focus needs to be today. And every business leader, to your point, had to do something similar in their own businesses. Yes. Now I can only speak to a small, like small business. Here we are, you know, in, to your, your listeners. I can't imagine the layers and layers of a large corporation, you know, whether, you know, a fortune 100 company or what have you. And that's why you have to have those key um, leaders, the vice presidents, what have you, be completely in alignment with your vision to be able to carry out that conversation to the next layer, because you have to stop that, that panic, because if you don't have consistent communication, people naturally think the worst, right? Yep. So that was the other thing that we implemented really quickly is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday meetings, nine o'clock. So we had FaceTime together. Instead of once a week, we went three times a week but there were so many unknowns yep. that it, there was comfort. And part of that was listening to the fear and listening to the reality because we have a lot of pe people and you know, everybody does have compromised situations where it's a sick parent or spouse or child, right? right? That it, it goes beyond your employees, your associates. It's that next layer too you have to think about. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, 
yeah, it, it's, it was a tough situation, of course. And I, and I think that the true leaders really did emerge from that. And you can see it inside of your organization and maybe somebody that you never thought was ready to be a leader emerged and, and understood the importance of empathy and helping people to understand things. Because you're right, it, if the message isn't coming directly from you or the leaders that you're giving information to that then get it to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, uh, if it's not coming direct, then you've got potential problems, right? There's gossiping and backbiting and all those sorts of things that can go on inside of an organization and not to mention the fear, right? I mean, I, my wife told me this, this story the other day, she went to the doctor's office with my daughter who needed to have an ingrown toenail removed, yeah. right? And she goes to our normal primary care and finds out from them that they've been so slow because nobody wants to get their normal physicals. Nobody wants to do any of that kind of stuff because they don't want to be in the doctor's office where there's potentially COVID being transmitted. Sure. So you don't think about a doctor's office actually slowing down during this pandemic. And one of the, one of the PAs that, that they met with said, you know, it was so slow. We we're asking the doctor slash owner of this practice, are we okay? Because he hadn't communicated right? He hadn't Very communicated good. to them right. that they are okay. Yes, we're down, you know, we're at 30% of what we were before, but we're smart about this. Our costs are low. We've got reserves, you know, all this, all the types of things that business owners need to be, or managers need to be communicating to their employees, or they start to think about it on their own, right? So absolutely true. Fear of the unknown people will leave their jobs to go somewhere else that they know is in a better financial position. So to your point, I think leaders have to be comfortable in talking about the finances with their organization. I don't care how small it is or how large it is because that peace of mind, they're worried about their families. They're worried about their mortgage, right? So that communication, that transparency, again, is going to contribute to that healthy culture and people will be, uh, associates, employees will appreciate it. Yeah, no, uh, there's no doubt about it. So as a leader, what do you do to obviously avoid those types of conversations going on in the background, gossip or whatever, you know, or the fear or the, you know, belief that something is worse than it is or better than it is? What, what do you do as a leader to avoid those sorts of things with your employees? Great. So, so we we're talking about tactics to build a healthy culture. And I shared some of those. So that lunch together, that meet, Monday morning meeting, but also here's a key and leaders, I beg you to do this weekly one-to-ones with your associates. So there's no important investment than your associates, your employees. I like to say associates because um, I work side by side with you. I don't like to think that you work for me. I work with you. And again, that language shift is really important too. So in those one-to-ones, you can talk about anything. Your goals and your, in your, in your work, maybe some deliverables, but hey, what was that, that, that comment about, tell me more about that. And do you really feel that way? Because, um, I don't see it that way, but I want to, I want to learn, you know, and, and because I, it, that transparency and honesty from the leader is really, really important. And it also helps you self-correct either yourself or within the organization. So one of the things I, I share is that some people will self-select out. Like they can't be in a good environment. And I say, you know, everybody can have a bad day but you can't have a bad month every single day. Right? <laughs> so, you know what? I, I, I get it. You know, something happens and, and, and you can bring it to the office, but when it is so good, people actually will look forward to coming there for maybe, I want to say for peace, but for acceptance and understanding and that respect that we're, we're building. Yeah. So, and let me, get, let me tell you, if someone has a doctor's appointment or their kid has a recital or a show, I want you there. I want you there. Don't worry about, about that. And I want you to take care of your health. You know, 
And I think about that and I wish I would have had that in all the different places I've worked, you know? And so now we get to create a place where people are working in their gift. They are responsible and empowered. They know they're trusted and respected. And what does that do for us, Austin? We just got ranked 22 best places to work by the Phoenix Business Journal. <laughs> Two years in the making, my friend. Two years in the making. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I think that's obviously the the payoff to, to putting in the effort, right? Yeah. And you know, you mentioned healthy culture, but you also mentioned personal health, right? Mm-hmm. And understanding that people need to have some work-life balance. We spend more time at work than we do with our own families, right? Yeah. And so we, we've got to we've got to be able to provide that. And I, you know, I, it just reminded me of a book that I read a few years ago, and I don't remember the title of it, but it was essentially the the biography of Larry H. Miller, the former mm-hmm. owner of the Utah Jazz. He owns a bunch of car dealerships in Utah, Arizona, Idaho. They've 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 over the years, you know, had a bunch of um, Uh, movie theaters and, you know, just pretty big enterprise. And it started with him working in the parts department at a car dealership. And he just worked hard and put in the effort. But there's an underlying theme in this book in that it was actually finished on his deathbed. And he passed away at a pretty young age because he didn't take care of himself. He had so much drive and he worked and worked and worked and worked, but he wasn't eating and he wasn't drinking enough water and he had diabetes. He essentially ended up dying from complications from diabetes. So it started with, you know, removing the foot because of gout and all those kinds of things. And then eventually he just, he succumbed. And it just reminds me of this old adage of you can work your entire life to build this wealth. And then you spend the rest of your wealth trying to get your health back. And so there's, there's got to be this, this balance that all of us, you know, try to figure out. And it's, it's up to us as leaders within certain parameters yeah, to yeah. allow our, our employees to do that for themselves as well. Absolutely true. And we're trying to figure out right now some kind of program, whether it's yoga or gym membership or what, we're trying to figure that out right now because I want that to be a part of the support um, for that holistic within our organization. And I want to mention a book that changed my life and um, it's called Man's Search for Meaning and it's by Dr. Viktor Frankl and um, I'm familiar with it, but it yep. He chronicles his experience as a prisoner in Nazi concentration camps in World War II. And how can you have a bad day? I think about his story and what the two, the two reasons he was able to live was um, he thought of his purpose. He thought of whatever his purpose was. So his family, his children, what that purpose is. And then also imagine the outcome. So those two really, what a mindset, what a mindset, what is your purpose? Imagine the outcome. And, you know, if I have a a bad moment, I really do think about this book and I think about him. Yeah. Yeah. I actually read that in business school and it's one that I should go back and reread. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it's a very good, very good book that puts us on in the right frame of mind, I should say. That's right. That's right. And I would say also really living in gratitude because we are fortunate in in what we do and what we have here in the United States and whether, and I see everybody as a leader, you can lead in your community, you can lead a, um, a a group, you can lead a department, you, you can lead yourself, right? Nobody has that, that be all end all title. You can be a leader of your family. Yeah. Absolutely. So, mm-hmm. Well, believe it or not, Nancy, we are coming to the end of our time. It's uh, It's been a fantastic conversation. I've enjoyed the time together. I always enjoy spending time with you and, and speaking with you uh, regardless. But I'm going to give you the last couple of minutes to just reiterate where to find you guys on the website, where to find you on LinkedIn, and anything else that you'd like the listeners to know. Thank you, Austin. It's a pleasure and privilege to spend time with you today. I really appreciate it. And um, so you can find us, Catholic Education Arizona at ceaz.org 
or please call us. We have an incredible team at 602-218-6542. And, um, you know, ask us any questions about tax contributions, tax credits, whether you're an individual or a company of any size. So uh, we'll be happy to help you. And on our website is chock full of videos and how to's and podcasts. And um, I'm just mostly grateful, um, not only being here, but um, for my team and for my board of directors. We really have a terrific organization and I really believe we're gonna continue to grow. Uh, that's awesome. 20, 22nd best employer in, in Phoenix. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. We really appreciate you being on the, on the program. I appreciate our personal relationship and, and uh, look forward to watching you as you progress even further with Catholic Education Arizona. Thank you. Happy New Year, Austin. Happy New Year, everyone. You too. Thank you. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mintz. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your